Thank you. Greetings once again. Now, we will straight away get into vertical mode and have lift off. So, we're in the apocalypse and it's chapter 11. And we have this echo of the cosmic praise of which we have a part when we're on earth. Here we have, before the throne of God, this chant going up. We give thanks to the Lord God Almighty. That word there, Almighty Pantocrator, gives us the name for many icons in the East, and the Christ who looks over the assembly from the dome, blessing them, the Almighty. Who art and who wast, that thou hast taken thy great power and begun to reign. So here, what we have to do with is authority and power. We have to do with somebody who rules over us, and we are in prostrate mode before him. We must never forget that whenever we handle anything to do with liturgy, we are giving to the Supreme King his rights. So, on it goes, the nations ranged, but thy wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, for rewarding thy servants, the prophets and saints. One thinks in these last weeks of Père Jacques, Hamel, there, that lovely priest in France, in an area I know, Rouen, who, as he was expiring and seeing what was happening, said in French, Va-t'en, Satan. Be gone, Satan. He intuited what was before him. Interesting, too, that in the French media, when this butchery was being reported, the main news media calmly and explicitly talked of le crime du sacrilège, the crime of sacrilege, indicating something of the instinct of faith still somewhere there under the skin in mainstream France. Whereas in Catholic Ireland, I am told that the word Sacrilege did not enter into it when reporting the same scene. Interesting. And what happened? Rewarding thy servants, the prophets and saints, we can be sure that good Père Jacques went like a rocket from the altar to the altar of this praise, which we see here in the vision of St. John on Patmos. Because those who die martyrs are on the cross with Christ and benefit fully from all the power of redemption at the moment of departure from this life to the next. Like rockets, they whiz straight up to the maximum. And so, rewarding these people, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. The temple of God, then, is seen to be opened and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Wow! So, that is what we have to do with when we're at the altar. The Ark of the Covenant is there. And it is important that we never forget that when in church, the presence is dense. Do you know that at the moment of consecration, already at the Epiclesis, when the Spirit is invoked, the guardian angels of all present zoom towards the altar. There's a dense angelic presence there, just around the elements about to be consecrated. And we are distraught. We are elsewhere. We are planning what to do after the celebration is over. How many graces go into the air in vain? So, in that context, I would like to go back to ground zero and to see where we're coming from. I did mention in the past how we did not come from the moon, but actually took on a good measure of what was there when we landed. 
and what are these elements? I looked last time at the link already with the Hallel because it was the Peshach meal that is the context of the first celebration and so the Grand Hallel was sung. But there is more. The Lord gave the essence at the Last Supper when he said, do this in memory of me. So we are to repeat what he did. Essentially, that contains what the church was going to build on over the centuries by an organic growth under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the first stage. We have here an expert, Theodor Klauser, commenting on the original development of the sacred liturgy. The fundamental acts of worship of the early church, the celebration of the Eucharist, the rites of the sacraments, prayer in common, and the liturgical sermon, all go back to the express command of Jesus, or at least based on his example and commendation. Jesus, however, did not originate these liturgical acts, but took them over from the practice of late Judaism. The primitive church continued this policy. To a limited extent, it created, of its own accord, forms of worship which had not already been laid down by Jesus, but to a much greater extent, it fashioned its worship according to the liturgical customs of Judaism. In Gentile congregations, borrowings were made increasingly from the religious practices of the Greco-Roman world. Now, we see that coming through, for instance, in the way in which, in the East, much of the trappings of honour given in the context of an imperial court eventually became orientated towards honour given to the highest representative of Christ on earth, their bishop or patriarch. In the words of Klaus Gamber, now he's a great liturgist, in their origins, the forms of Christian worship, so far as their relation to Judaism is concerned, were nothing fundamentally new. So, we're talking here about the very first period. As Christianity spread, its forms of worship developed and diversified. The language, gestures, prayers, vesture and music used were influenced, but not exclusively produced by the local church. In the West, according to, now this is the great Jesuit liturgist, Joseph Jungmann. By the turn of the 5th century, we find the framework of the Roman Mass established. So this is the fundamental period of generation of liturgy as it came to be. The period between the Last Supper and the 5th century. The Venerable Bede witnesses to the formation of the liturgy in England. Late in the 6th century, St. Augustine of Canterbury writes to Pope St. Gregory the Great, asking about liturgical customs. Now, St. Gregory died in 604, and he had sent, Augustine, remember, with his 40 monks, 
from the Celian Hill to England. They went in 596 and arrived in 597. So there is a contact all the time with the Pope. And if I'm not mistaken, the first cathedral at Canterbury was dedicated to St. Peter, which so is the bond. So here we have this ancient quotation from Pope St. Gregory the Great, addressed to St. Augustine of Canterbury. My brother, you are familiar with the usage of the Roman Church, in which you were brought up. But... If you have found customs, whether in the Church of Rome, or of Gaul, or any other that may be more acceptable to God, I wish you to make a careful selection of them, and teach the Church of the English, which is still young in the faith, whatever you have been able to learn with profit from the various churches. Select from each of the churches <coughs> whatever things are devout, religious and right. And when you have bound them as it were into a sheaf, let the minds of the English grow accustomed to it. So we see how gentle he is and how open-minded. And we also see how that spirit of gentleness and natural organic growth and development is always to be the tone in the transmission and enrichment of liturgy. He wants them to grow accustomed to it. It's true also in non-Catholic worship that tendentially, not always now, but tendentially, when a minister goes into prayer mode, he will go into a mode of speaking, a mode of use of vocabulary and elevated language and diction and tone of voice, which he has grown naturally into and which is far more ancient than himself. Even the way he dresses sometimes will go back a long way. This is, therefore, a natural rule of man that when it comes to the sacred, what has worked is fallen back upon as something which creates spontaneously and naturally, without force, an atmosphere which is safe and which is recognised because we are accustomed to it. And so too it is our natural Catholic instinct. When, here and there, a whiz kid of a celebrant deliberately shocks and jettisons all that, he may win a round of applause and gain the title of being brilliant, spectacular and innovative, but he may actually have upset the apple cart and been an obstacle to the natural access of the people of God to what they're familiar with and which has always worked, because they're thinking about him and not about Jesus Christ, who is actually to be adored at that moment. So we need to be careful before deliberately being wanting to be interesting. It may work, but the chances are that something else will work. Very pleasing to you know who. So, what's happening here? It's probably the result of the surprise which Augustine of Canterbury had when he discovered how much there was already there in place. We're talking about the way that the spirit had moved in these Celtic lands already and how there had been organic growth partly 
linked with the East because the Celtic Church was very monastic and there was a strong cross fertilization between the Eastern monastic world with its austerity and that of the West. We find certain things in common the cells around a church and so on with great prayer and fasting, manual work, simplicity, obedience and very long offices and an awful lot of penance and austerity in general. We know how long the offices were because we have texts. They are in Latin, which is interesting, and they show how psalms were sung for hours on end. So this is what would have surprised Augustine, finding that there was in place a very monastic setup already, to some extent, in parts at least of the British Isles, some parts. And the abbot, of course, was very important. So he was presuming a lot when he came with this papal mission, and he had to therefore recalculate, rather like the satnav, recalculating. And he was asking for advice from the top man. And so here St. Gregory was giving wise advice. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Basically, if you can take what is precious there and works very well, see if you can use it. It's the kind of advice, actually, that centuries later the Jesuits would be giving when they went down to difficult situations like China and Japan. They were trying to take on board what might be usable. It led to the famous quarrel of the rights, debate of the rights. The Vatican was a bit hesitant about going too far because they didn't want to confuse, actually, error because of the receiving of practices. But they were trying their best. The Jesuits were really experts at frontline evangelization. I close that parenthesis, but it shows that the problem recurs each time the gospel reaches new lands. And actually, the council itself attacked the issue when it talked about semina verbi, seeds of the word. Meaning by that, that the Spirit of God is always trying to be at work in the salvation of man, and therefore that one will find traces of his activity all over the globe. And so it was a discreet invitation to see if there's anything there which we can use and harness. The people recognize what is sacred unto them already. And one is sometimes edified by the way that, for instance, in Asiatic Catholic worship, they benefit from the natural temperament and practice of stillness, which is ingrained in their temperament. They are still, they are able to enter into mode already as a people, far more, I would say, easily than we are in the West. For we are contaminated by thumping noises, thumping noises, thumping noises. I remember in Rome, because we were looked after by Indian nuns, our big generalate, the Norbertine house there in Rome, was divided into two. We had the main part, but the nuns had their convent, which was part of the same complex. They had their own enclosure and they had their own chapel. But in their chapel, there weren't any chairs. The celebrant may have had one, but they were always on the floor, and they were very still, and it was very edifying. Beauty of chant and even movement, interiority, and no thumping noises. It is difficult to identify principles, principles of liturgical reform in the period of the very formation of the liturgy. We can, however, observe that the liturgy is a developing entity. There was no one time in the first six centuries where its development halted. The liturgy was a living reality, an organism and was capable of further growth. This cannot but
but be a fundamental component of any principles of liturgical reform. Similarly, we can observe in St. Gregory's reply that there is a clear sense in which the liturgy is received and not simply constructed anew according to the tastes of the people among whom he finds himself, and that innovation must be for good reason and carefully integrated with the tradition. Now remember one detail. Augustine did receive from Gregory liturgical books, so it was concretely the Roman liturgy that was coming in. Remember now, the expression Gregorian chant is not there without a reason. The already ancient chant of the church was codified by Pope Gregory, hence the name, but it was pre-existent. We can also see that the Pope and the bishop exercise authority over the liturgical forms to be used. We have the Pope recognising the possibility of diversity in local forms. He even allows considerable freedom to St. Augustine. Specifically in the case of the English, because he has to form their rites. The liturgy contained elements handed on that were regarded as untouchable. Clearly, the words and actions of our Lord with bread and wine fall into this category. However, later, non-dominical, that means elements not from the Lord himself, products of tradition, were also accorded such reverence. The prime example being the Roman canon. Now remember, the Roman canon in its essence is of apostolic origin. We can see that from the words. This precious chalice is coming in there. The very one the Lord used. While this certainly underwent further development in the 7th and 8th centuries, now remember, one problem with it is that it's a bit jerky. That's for historic reasons, it, it would seem that there were bits being added. You see, one of the bits would have been to balance out one of the mementos, they would add on eventually the other memento, so that we have a memento for the living and for the dead. But one is earlier than the other. And also we see a very early afterthought in these seven early female martyrs coming on. We can see probably what's happened there. Oh, what about the ladies? So they've come on in one bunch at the end. While this certainly underwent further development in the 7th and 8th centuries, Clauser, this author I mentioned, reports that by the 6th century it was looked upon as part of the most sacred apostolic tradition with capital T. Thus, at the close of the 6th century, we find developed liturgical rites that are themselves sacred, yet capable of further development, a living but nevertheless objective tradition. Okay, I'll come back in a few minutes. So, before carrying on, I would like to draw attention to the fact that we have to be very humble in the realm of sacred liturgy and that we do well to be aware that if we have been in a situation of geographic isolation, such as our case in Ireland, for instance, we are in danger of presuming that that is the norm worldwide and also on the level of world chronology. Actually, it's grossly mistaken. People who come to Ireland from Poland or other countries are actually quite startled by the way in which our celebrations are very swift and functional compared with the richness that might be the norm in some, not every, other culture 
or cultures. And therefore, we need to be aware that it's not healthy to be in a situation all our life in which we're not challenged. We need to be aware that the spirit is around over the whole planet and has been over time. And therefore, to be aware that a big chunk of our brethren across the world are worshipping on a regular basis in an unchanged mode. We think of our brethren in the East. And they are precisely in that ambit of fear and trembling before the sacrality of something which is untouchable. They would never dream of tampering with something so great and led by the Spirit calmly over the centuries. It is the Spirit's work and not man's. And therefore we need to be aware that if we want to just calmly be a in front of the reality which is our history, to some extent also in the West, we can go still to parts of the Christian world where things have not been in a hurry to change. And then one comes back, and if one compares the majesty and serenity and tranquility and interiority of this unchanging Eastern style, which too is ours, in the high mass in the West, and can still be found in good celebrations, then when one compares that with what people itch to do to in some way show how brilliant they are, then one sees whether perhaps some other sinister force is at work, attacking the sacred, attacking the sacred, attacking yet again the sacred, it's kind of serious because these things happen precisely because those who are ordained to protect the sacred get into a situation where they're no longer aware that they're falling into the hands of style and essentially anthropocentric dynamics. As though man were in control, as though the point of reference of the assembly were that assembly and not something greater. The liturgy is not man-made or man-orientated, and it's not for the pleasure of man. It is, precisely as I began, what is happening in heaven. Man on his all fours, nothing at all, rendering unto the King of glory his rights and his alone. To then come into the centre and want attention in some way is to use the slot of liturgy to glorify man. And we will see the fruits. Is God going to bless that? Will that lead to vocations? Hmm. So, I just happened to find this. And it's worth being aware of. It's just as a juxtaposition of Eastern liturgy to, I suppose, the worst of what can happen in a actually Episcopal celebration in the West. We can see a cardinal and one or two bishops present in the Catholic version, therefore it is being done with Episcopal authority, and we have the equivalent here in the East. And whereas in the first case we just repose and let it happen, in the second we are expected to applaud and join in the band. So let's just have a look at this, just to make a point. It won't do any harm whatsoever. People remember things which are explicit, far better than theories and words in the air. Now, are you sitting uncomfortably? Then I shall begin. Now, listen to this. This is okay to start off with.
we need to be aware that once things are in place, then there is a certain serenity and things can then calmly grow and be added. But the structure is already in place very early on. Certain things are common to East and West, but other things have their own development. One thing which is common to the whole of the liturgical development in all the sectors of the world is the orientation. One can see from early Christian architecture that the orientation was always towards the East, priest and people. Now, the liturgy of the Roman Church had, in its Latin form, been gradually developed by the labours of the popes in writing prayers, in particular by St. Leo the Great and Gelasius I. So here we're talking about the end of the 5th century, 492-496, that kind of period. Under Gregory the Great and his immediate successors, it received its final form, which found its concrete embodiment in the so-called Gregorian Sacramentary, the so-called Gregorian Antiphonary, the Capitulare Evangeliorum, so we're talking about here the things to be read, and the Ordines. Now, these would be indications of what the clergy were to do, that last bit. The Gregorian Sacramentary contains the prayers to be recited by the celebrant at last throughout the liturgical year, so it's complete, and those to be said at the administration of the sacraments. The Ordines give directions to the clergy containing the ritual procedure to be observed at each liturgical function. So it would seem that there is no trace of any real advance in the development of the Roman liturgy during this period, with the minor exceptions of the introduction to the Mass of the Lord's Prayer by Gregory the Great, and of the Annus Dei by Pope Sergius I. He reigns from 687 to 701. So that gives us some idea of the antiquity of the structure of what essentially goes on, just growing as time goes on, until the Council of Trent. But I'm not going to go any further historically than that point where I am now today. However, I would like to make a reference to some other aspect of the work of Gregory, which has given us the name Gregorian, in so far as he did give also to the West this standardized form of the chant of the church. It is a chant which echoes in our heart and ear because it corresponds to the natural scale of the human voice. If we compare it with the chant in Greece, there are differences. In Russia too. In Russia, a big difference is the great use of polyphony made, and also the greater openness to mixed choirs, male and female, in Greece, one sees the primitive nature of the scales of the Orient coming in there. And it would be a study in itself to see to what extent those are linked also with Semitic tones and current Arabic ones. The chant in some Oriental rites, Catholic, I mean Christian rites, do contain elements of origin which are quite primitive and very interesting for a musician. If one comes to Ireland, one is aware that there is a tonality in ancient singing, 
which is akin to the Irish spirit, we find elements actually in common between certain parts of the East and this, insofar as we have these tiny bits of note coming in. The vibration of the voice, essentially it's a kind of a third of a tone. Now, it is possible that early Gregorian chant had something of that, and that we have a residue of it in the notation. Those tiny bits of note hidden underneath them, if you see what I mean. But as it is now, the Gregorian chant that we know does correspond naturally to what we would want to hear. It is not in harmony. Now, plain chant means that. There is no polyphony in Gregorian chant. That is why it is actually easier to have a sung mass in Gregorian chant than in polyphony, because people can easily learn the most usual one to be sung, Mass of the Angels, Misa de Angelis, and then if the priest and one or two people can sing the bits which are proper, the introit and so on, then you have a full Gregorian Mass, which is not that difficult to put on compared with a polyphonic celebration which demands a trained choir. So, just to get that straight, it's not that difficult. And we must remember that Blessed Paul VI did insist that the basic, well-known tones of the Gregorian repertoire should be maintained and used. He did publish this volume, which went by the Catholic world in the early 70s, Jubilate Deo. I have it here. It's basically the Mass of the Angels and the chants for benediction, that kind of thing, which are very easy and which were known by any Joe Bloggs, a Catholic world for donkey's years, and so they can still be used. There's no need for that to be lost. They're very simple once they're learned. So it's not fair to say that it's too complicated. That is not true. Because what is too complicated is, is what we have now with regard to expertise on the level of folk music in which we have only a certain group of young people usually singing their own thing. And the people are sitting there like lemons listening to the performance, no less, and getting a good round of applause afterwards. That's not liturgy. That's performance. Anyway, that's another story. So... When I was in Rome, I wasn't yet ordained, but I was studying there, and we were having, obviously, in our house, which was an orbiting house, very good liturgy. All the offices were well celebrated, organ music and so on, and the high mass on a Sunday was something else, but also on a weekday, and all the other offices, these were very beautifully executed. So i just finish with what I wrote there in Rome, when still a student, and just happy to be with my brethren in this house that we had on the small Aventine in Rome, not far from Sant'Anselmo, where, of course, they had the same thing but bigger, but we had our own too, which was very nice, and lots of incense used. And so it was, I think, the first time I was doing second canter. It was my first week there, a second canter, but I remember writing this straight after because I was very really moved by the fact that we were creating beauty for the Lord with just simple means. So, I'll leave you with this. Canting. First week, a second canter. In Rome, in student days. There are so many songs that from the throat can come and find a home within the earth. And though a melody is but a note within another weaved, I do not hear but noise when these are struck. For something moves across the sky when there is beauty heard. And in the little tingling that these grooves and staves of thought direct, there is a word, not made of meaning, but of flesh and sense that strokes as it strikes softly on the soul and fondles 
unmade matter. Nay, skies dense with little wings insensate, sense the whole of what we hear set forth. For in this place there is the sound of oft a touching.